I spilled coffee on it. So um, fortunately, I've got a good, mem good enough memory. No ladies study either until the ninth. So uh, there may be some honking this morning. Uh, no worries, we're taking care of that. You may have heard it out in the parking lot. Um, however, if it starts when people are leaving, if you would um, wait until the vehicle has departed, just for safety's sake. Uh, if you want to know more, well, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> On this day, I'd like to start off by saying, Christ is risen. All right, we all know that one, all right. Today is the day that we remember and celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, Christmas Day? Is that what, today's Christmas Day? So is that a scheduling error on my part? I do plan out my preaching calendar kind of in advance, um, but while I'm not always given to preach special messages for special times of the year, I can be a bit odd when I do, but that's not really a surprise then, is it? So why did I think of Easter on Christmas? <clears throat> you know, there's some things going on there. Mike shared one on Facebook this morning that uh, on Christmas we should remember why he came. But there are also some strong indications that December 25th was chosen to celebrate Christ's birth because of Easter. Are you confused yet? All right. There was once a tradition in the church that many of God's messengers, his prophets, people that he used mightily on earth, that their day of death was the same as the day of their conception. I'm not really sure where they got that from, but that was a belief. And from that tradition, they calculated that Passover and the year of Christ's death was in our calendar, March 25th. Now, if... If that tradition was assumed true, then if you count forward nine months, the delivery date would have been on December 25th. And babies always arrive on time. All right. Well, that's why I began to think about Easter this time of year. But it's not the reason I picked an Easter message. I chose an Easter message on Christmas because of presents and gift giving. This morning, I want us to contemplate the gift of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we will look at two different passages. We'll consider John 19.30 and Romans 3.23-25. We're going to examine a few texts as we mind them for the details of Christ's finished work on the cross, a gift that has been made complete. As the work of the cross accomplished multiple needs for sinners to escape God's wrath and then to receive as a gift grace, mercy, and indeed sonship. And the work of the cross, it's explained by John Piper in this way. This is, yeah, the wisdom of God devised a way for the love of God to deliver sinners from the wrath of God while not compromising the righteousness of God. It had to be all of those things. The wisdom of God devised a way for the love of God to deliver sinners from the wrath of God while not compromising the righteousness of God. And when Christ had accomplished this, he said, it is finished. We'll look at John 19.30. I'll read both of the texts as we get started. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And in Romans, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward 
as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. It is finished. What is finished? John 19.30. Is it the dying? I mean, he hangs his head and dies then. Is that what is finished? Yes, but no. Jesus Christ, at the culmination of his life and ministry, recorded in the Gospels, he has been obedient to fulfill a task laid upon him by the Father to seek and save the lost. His ministry, it's complete. It is perfect at this moment. The phrase, it is finished. When John wrote this, the language that he used, this is one word that we make into three. The word means, and perhaps you have heard this, it means paid in full. Nothing lacking. There is no red on the book except the red of blood. It is done. The way John writes this, the language he wrote this in, that God used, it, it has some amazing qualities. But the way he writes it, Christ's perfect, complete work is a one-time action, we see it on the cross, that yields a continuous result going into the future. Now, not only does this mean that people will continue to be saved until God calls an end to all things, but also it means that once he saves you, he is always the one saving you. you there is nothing outside of that salvation, or as some people claim, once saved, always saved. My preference for that phrase is the perseverance of the saints. Because of what Jesus did, paid in full, and it is done. And rather than a groan of defeat and death, this is a heavenly victory cry. This is work accomplished. Now, sometimes we can lay hold of a little bit of that concept when we get a hard job done and we feel the sense of it. But this is the culmination of God's plan from eternity past, now done. Now, they will be laying his body in a grave. But it's a borrowed tomb because he intends to give it back. They won't be able to hold him. Death can't hold him. But in this moment, Christ has received my punishment. Yours too, if you believe in him. In this moment, he has paid the debt in full. Now, I remember when I paid off my student loan. That was pretty cool. And it took a while. This is an eternal debt, now paid and done. And in this, the Savior doubly owns us. Jesus, according to John, is the one who made all things. Paul tells us that as well. Jesus Christ, your creator, he made you and you are his. And if you've trusted in his word, your Savior, he has bought you at a price. You are not your own. You have been purchased. And once purchased from the realm of sin and death, you will always be his own. Set aside to him for his own purpose, which is the definition of holiness. Set aside to God for God. It is finished. Paul explains this concept to the church at Corinth. And you know, a lot of things had to be explained to them and to us. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. It is finished. What this means for us is Christ 
paid it all. There's nothing left to pay. Not a thing. You couldn't pay your debt if you wanted to. It's worse than student loans. You would be crazy, unhinged, to want to pay this on your own. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ endured an eternity of wrath for your sin and the sins of all the elect. And he, he endured that eternal wrath and he completed it in three hours. An eternity of eternities of deserved wrath on your behalf. And if you have believed in him, you are now free from sin's penalty of death and hell. And you are the recipient of a present that isn't wrapped up in paper with a bow, but is the present to have any time of the year. Eternal life that begins now. And we call this grace. It is a gift paid for by another. It isn't what we deserve. Uh, we deserve a lot of coal stoked hot. Let's consider why. What's going on here? Let's consider the situation in Romans 3.23. Here's the situation. Sinners deserve God's wrath. That's, that's our wage, our compensation. Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now, hopefully none of this is that much of a surprise. Let's go. Every last sinner, or every last person rather, is a sinner, and that most definitely includes me. And I've known you for a while, and I'm willing to say that that includes you as well. I mean, you just got to spend some time meeting some people. Now, we are not sinners because we sin. This may sound like a minor thing, but it's very important. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. It is the essence of of us, the essence of mankind in our natural state, we sin because we are sinners. We are fundamentally and radically fallen. Now, radically does not mean what it meant whenever I was a high schooler in the 90s. It means right down to the very root of us. Fallen, depraved, sin is our default natural state. That's who we are. And because of sin, every last person, we have earned, earned the wrath of God. That's, that's our, our due. It's our inheritance as a child of Adam. The wage of deserving death. Now, it involves physical death which almost everyone faces. There have been a few. Then there's the end times. Physical death, sure. It also includes spiritual death. The second death. The second death is to stand before the judge and be found rightly, truly, completely guilty of sin. The law is consulted, and for that, the penalty prescribed is wrath and eternal separation from the grace of God. Not from his presence, because we're told in the Bible that in hell they are tormented in the presence of the Lamb. But the absence of grace and mercy and love. The sin that we are guilty of 
It is defined by God's nature, by his person, by his character, by his glory. Sin is not a matter of man's preference because, uh, well, the things that are considered allowed in our society, they come and go. These are based in the nature of God. Lying is a sin because God doesn't lie. Sin, it's an act, an attitude, a disposition against the person, the character, and the nature of God revealed by his will in the word. I've known a few people who claim they've never sinned. That claim alone is a heinous sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that's the situation this morning. You are a sinner, and what you deserve is wrath. This is the bad news. And the bad news must, must precede the good news. In order to lay hold of the good news, the bad news must be understood. You must know that you are destitute before God. You bring nothing to salvation except the sin that you need to be saved from. You must know that you are dead in sin. Unable to save yourself because dead men just lay there. You're not mostly dead. You're dead dead. That's alright, you can laugh at the Miracle Max reference. And then by God's grace, you spy a solution to your sinful state. A Savior. Jesus Christ. And so we then consider the solution in Romans 4, uh, 3.24. And we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justification in Jesus Christ alone is the one and only solution to sin and death. There is no more than one way to God. Only one. And this justification is freely given, cannot be earned, will never be deserved. And this justification is the very point at which salvation occurs, when the blood of Christ is applied to the sinner's account by the grace of God. It is finished, is the point of justification. And this justification is a ransom. Probably heard that phrase before, you are redeemed. As a kid, I used to pick up bottles and cans, take them to the redemption center. The word ransom is exactly what it sounds like. Your justification was purchased by another. Ransoming includes the idea of buying someone out of slavery and debt. Both of these apply to us. Slaves to sin, indebted to God, and dead. Jesus Christ paid the ransom for your very soul. Now, this ransom was paid to God. Some have taught in error that Jesus Christ buys us from hell and Satan. And this is wrong. The debt you owe, you owe to God. You have earned that wrath. And then Jesus Christ, when you believe in him, he has paid that debt for you. Paul in Ephesians says that in him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. That's the solution. The solution for your sin debt, redemption by Jesus Christ. That's what this means for us. You couldn't pay your debt. You were deep in debt. Getting deeper. Not just because of interest, but because of the perpetual attitude of our sinful heart. And then Jesus paid it. Paid it all, 
all at once done. And this is the good news that follows the bad news, that Jesus pays what you owe for your sin. Now, he can do this because Jesus had no sin debt of his own to pay. He could do this because he is an abundant, overflowing fountain of grace and mercy. And he earns salvation for you. And then he gives it freely to you, all who believe. And he provides this gift by being your substitute. Romans 3.25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now here's another important thing to note. You didn't start this. You did not initiate your salvation. You were a dead body on the ground. God himself initiates salvation for his people. God the Father the wisdom of God, set the plan of salvation in motion that resulted in the Son being put up as your substitute. You did not seek him out. You did not reach out to God. God reached out to you. And God satisfies his justice, his righteousness, by requiring his beloved and sinless son to pay the price of your sin. And Christ propitiated for us by his blood. I like big words. What does that even mean? Well, in Christ... God's wrath was satisfied. It was quenched. He separates us from our sin and satisfies the wrath of God. And this reconciles, saves sinners to God. Reconciliation. But this propitiation, this is not a one-way transfer in this, sin's guilt is transferred to Christ so that when God looked at him on the cross, he saw your sin paid now. And then it flows back the other way. And the merit that Jesus Christ earned is applied to you. So that when God looks at you, he doesn't see the sins he saved you from. He sees you wrapped in Jesus Christ. He looks upon you and sees Jesus. This does not mean that you are cleared of the charge of sin. You have not been found innocent. But you have been redeemed from the penalty. And all of this is received through faith in his blood. His life's blood was required to pay the penalty of sin. By faith, in him and his death, that it accomplishes salvation and pays your debt, that is how you are saved from sin and saved to God. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Romans 5. What we do with this is clinging by faith to the reality that the substitute of Christ for sinner is how you were saved. In Christ, you are at once both justified and still a sinner. You still sin. God does not condone your sin. But he separates you from it by Jesus Christ standing in your place to receive sin's penalty. Sproul says that by the benefit of Christ's propitiation, I am just in the eyes of God, just by Christ's righteousness, sinner by virtue of my own performance. Even as you sin, you are justified by Christ. So the point of salvation is its beginning. First, you are saved from the penalty of sin, death and hell. But there's more. Then you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, empowered by him, called to live a life of holiness and righteousness as God himself is saving you from the power of sin. And then one day, whether he calls you home or you get to hear that trumpet in the sky, he will bring you to your new home in his presence forever and you will there be saved in the presence of sin. That's the present under the tree. So as the musicians return, there are some rich and necessary things to believe as a result of what Christ did on the cross. First of all, there's a substitution. The Bible teaches something called the penal substitutionary atonement. That Jesus Christ received the wrath of God that you earned. And then there's propitiation. The Bible teaches that God's wrath for your sin is satisfied by Jesus. That he didn't deserve wrath, but received it. And God's wrath no longer rests upon you if you believe in him. And now, his righteousness transferred to you. And that's imputation. The Bible teaches that Christ's righteousness is laid to your credit. And his righteousness is received by faith that his death indeed paid your penalty. Then there's expiation. There's all sorts of things in this present. The Bible teaches that your sin's debt has been removed from you by Jesus Christ. And you can see how these are already interlocking and complementing one another, taped up prettier than I tape up presents. In Christ, you are removed as far as the east is from the west, from the death and hell that sin deserves. And there's justification. The Bible teaches that God declares you righteous because of Jesus Christ. The Westminster Catechism says that justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight. This is the present. And all of this depends upon a cross and an empty tomb. But it began plan in eternity past that included a morning in which there was a babe lying in a manger. Christmas points to the crucifixion. And by his resurrection, Christ defeated death. He defeated the penalty of sin. 
because he was raised from the dead in an imperishable body, you will also be raised if you have faith in Christ alone for salvation. Why cover all these things in this kind of detail? Isn't it enough to be saved and know it? To rejoice in it without explaining all of its parts? Yes and no. Yes, for the sake of your soul and for eternal life, it's enough to believe. But this belief is itself a birthday. And you are not meant to remain a babe in Christ forever. There's a time to put down the milk and get out the meat. You must grow. You must mature. You must strive to understand what God's Word says as best as you are able. Because no, it's not enough when you have reached that place where you have matured in your faith, when you know that you must have a reason for the hope that lies within you, always ready to offer it to those who need to know salvation. You should understand how salvation works as best you can for two reasons. One, you were called by Christ to go and make disciples. You should be sharing the bad news of sin with people who are stuck in death. And you should share the good news of Jesus Christ, the sin's cure. And the better you understand it, the better you can share it, the better you can answer questions about it. And reason two that you should know this, you should know this, you should know what Christ accomplished for you so that you may lay hold of the joy of it. That you can be moved by the grace of it, the mercy of it, that he saved something like me. And be moved with thanks. If you got an understanding of how sinful you are, you will feel the joy that he saved even you. To be moved by the beauty of Christ that we might adore him. We might worship him. We can understand a bit about who he is. To grasp exactly what he has done to dwell and experience what he is doing in you. One that he loved enough to die for. It is finished. Christ paid in full. The debt you deserve has been discharged. In Jesus Christ, you bear it no longer. Don't try to shoulder this burden by trying to earn his favor. Instead, this morning, celebrating his birth, bask in the grace of it, the mercy of it. Feel his favor. Experience his grace that he has provided by death and resurrection. This is the present this morning. From God to you, wrapped in a package of a squishy little baby. And this is the gift that I am praying that you are most thankful for this morning and forever. <laughs>